Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to this session. So the interview has become the interviewees. We would like to use this session just to summarize uh, and to recap key issues discussed from uh, the first session where we were talking about the role of good data for good policy making and also for creating an enabling environment for investment. And then we moved on, of course, to talk about the IDI and we moved on to talk about emerging technologies. And I know some of you did not have an opportunity during the sessions to, to raise their questions. So I have the panelists and we'll give you time to ask additional questions that you may have. Okay, so we have here with us uh, Dr. Alexandra Barboza, head of the Regional Center for Studies on the Development of the Information Society Brazil and the outgoing expert group on households indicators. We was looking at session two, big data for measuring the information <coughs> society, so welcome. And uh, we also have Professor Bao, who moderated plenary session three, measuring the information society report uh, 2017 and uh, you will be happy to, to address key issues that you may still have hanging. And we have Dr. Jin Shuo Shen, uh, Deputy Chief Engineer, China Academy of Information and Communications Technology, China. Uh, he moderated plenary session six, measuring emerging ICT trends. So please welcome. And we also have Dr. Mohamed Hamd, Director of Innovation, El Ghazala Communication Cyber Park, Tunisia. He moderated plenary session seven, smart data for smart sustainable cities. And I hope you are going to address the question from Mozambique, uh, how a developing country or least developed country like uh, Mozambique could be talking about smart cities uh, without talking about smart communities and smart individuals and smart villages. Uh, this is the composition of your panel. And uh, I would like to start with uh, Alex. Uh, to ask him, and he can choose also to, to highlight probably three key issues that came out of uh, his session. But before I do that, I would like just to say what were your main takeaways from the discussion of the results of uh, ITU's pilot project on big data for official statistics? And secondly, if you could address the issue of artificial intelligence is supported by cloud computing, internet of things, and big data. Um, and we know that they are becoming prevalent uh, and ubiquitous. And how prepared is Brazil and other Latin American countries as a whole for the social and economic, and what are the social and economic ramifications of the, these disruptive technologies? How can the work of your organization help Brazil harness the benefits of these technologies while mitigating the potential social and economic disruptions, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and good morning to all of you. It is indeed a real pleasure to be here again in this uh, plenary to bring my impressions on this WTIS. And of course, that uh, I will make my statements from a data producer's standpoint, right? But before I... Uh, go for the main points. I would like to, to give my impressions about this w, particular WTIS and how uh, it will impact the future on work on measuring the information society and of course how it will impact the both uh, expert groups on uh, indicators, I said indicators. Well, in the past two days I was listening very attentively all the speakers and my conclusion is that their ideas about emerging technologies, sustainable development, and economic growth are very much aligned. And at the end of the day, they converge to the need of measurement and production of reliable and comparable data to feed the policymaking process. So uh, it is much uh, necessary that our countries has well-established data production process in place 
to respond this data need. And there is no doubt that all the new technologies that we have been talking about the past days, including big data, IoT, cloud computing, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and many others, have already a significant impact uh, in the production of data. And I also think that we may agree that better data leads to better policies, right? So uh, all this debate is really very relevant. And at the same time, these technologies represent huge economic growth opportunities to countries. But uh, the key question here is how gov governments will take advantage of these opportunities uh, if they don't have reliable data. And I would like to pose some question, I, and I hope that you can go home uh, with this question in mind. Uh, and this is related to the role of data in the development, socioeconomic development. And the question is, is data a function of development or vice versa? What do I mean by this? Uh, developed countries, developed economies produce better data because they are developed or they are developed because they produce better data. This is something that we could think so that we can reply the answer, what are the roles of data in the development? Well, having said that, I would like to recall just uh, three or four uh, interesting points that uh, our guest speakers uh, shared with, with us in the past days. And I remember the first keynote speaker, Mr. Bowie uh, Guy, highlighting the role of ICT companies in the market, and he said that there is a need of maintaining the data production continuously over time. And he also highlighted the need of transparency on how data is collected and maintained. A second point that I really like very much was the, from the Minister of uh, ICT of Namibia that mentioned the importance of ICT skills and the role of education to foster knowledge and skills as key components of changing our lives. And he said also that to track this progress, we need data. That was what he said. Also, Mr. Said, the CEO of the Tunisian NSO, argued that to con create an enabling environment for investments, economic investments, social investments, investments in education, government should design policies based on reliable and quality data. And he also said that data should reflect the reality of each segment of society. Then Mr. Uh, Mahmoud from the Telecom Regulatory Commission of Bangladesh also mentioned the need of proper data interpretation. And he also highlighted the importance of quality data production. So, and also today and uh, yesterday, we had many, many speakers that follow different paths, but at the end of the day, all those paths lead us to the need of data for policy making, for investment, and socioeconomic growth. So now, Mr. Chair, I will try to address more directly your question very briefly. And I think that both expert groups, uh, EG8 and ECD, have to have in the back uh, stage the UN 23rd agenda for development. Uh, and this agenda that calls our countries and stakeholders uh, to act together to rise to the challenge of ensuring that no one is left behind, we have to think about how to measure those uh, targets. And uh, data and statistics production will be crucial for tracking the progress towards the objectives set out in the agenda. So in my opinion, Mr. Chair, all these uh, lessons that we learned from ITU project on big data, using ICT sector data to try to bring new methodologies to complement existing or to create new indicators are really very relevant. I think that uh, this is uh, an important step so that countries can try to convince themselves that using alternative data source is really very relevant. 
Uh, and I, I, I would say that uh, member states, to explore this new data source, we, we have to think about how to create partnerships, how to create uh, ethical and confidential and privacy agreements with uh, data, private uh, data providers. So all of this uh, is a very important lesson for us. And the combination of design data, administrative data, survey data, with big data is the ticket for the future, as has mentioned uh, once Robert uh, Groth, former director of the US Census Bureau. Now, talking about uh, Brazil and Latin America, I would like to highlight, in terms of uh, my country's initiatives to, in this context, we had approved in 2014 the Brazilian uh, civil rights framework for the internet, which is the Marco Civil Law, as we call. And this law governs the use of the internet in the country, uh, fostering uh, important principles, guarantees, rights, and obligations for the use of the internet in the country, and provide guidelines for actions from the central government, states, and municipalities. A second point that I would like to highlight is the, that this year, the Minister of Science, Technology, Innovation, and Communication launched a public consultation regarding the Brazilian strategy for the digital transformation, which includes guidelines and targets for digitalization of the Brazilian economy in the coming years. And third, that the Brazilian government is now defining what we call the Brazilian National IoT Plan. And this plan, as you may imagine, will define actions to be taken into priority areas for the applications of IoT, such as smart cities, health, and agriculture. And last, uh, about the, my region, I would like to mention that uh, UN ICLAC, the UN Regional Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, is coordinating the ILAC uh, agenda in, in the region. And this agenda engages all countries in this new digital transformation wave. So uh, our actions are much aligned with uh, international agendas, such as the UN 23rd Agenda or the WISIS Agenda, and uh, promotes important debates on the transformation of the consumer-based internet into the production-based uh, internet. And this is really important to foster the digital economy in the region. Those are main highlights. Thank, thank you very much for that uh, uh, comprehensive uh, review. Uh, it's the problem of the referee. I didn't spell out the rules of the game. So <laughs> we are going to have the chairman's summary, so I, I would like to plead with the panelists to be very brief. If you could take about three minutes so that we can give the audience an opportunity to interact with you. But uh, thank you very much, Alex, for, for, yes. Dr. Chen, you are a renowned uh, researcher with experience on the development of information societies. Uh, in three minutes, if you could, please. Uh, what were your main takeaways from the discussion of the measurement of emerging ICT trends? And in your view, how important is it for countries to start working on internationally <coughs> comparable indicators that track the development of these new technologies? And how can we ensure that information societies at different levels of development worldwide can benefit equitably from developments in artificial intelligence, big data, cloud computing, and Internet of Things? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, based on our uh, discussion in plenary session six, we have touched upon the uh, you know, comprehensive hot topics such as AI, big data, IoT, uh, and cloud computing. Uh, I have uh, three, important, uh, three important findings uh, based on our uh, speech and questions, uh, Q&A. Uh, number one, more and more countries, no matter it's developing countries or developed countries, are included in the wave of digital transformation process, just like the, uh, uh, our delegates from, uh, from Brazil has just mentioned. Uh, they have uh, inevitably, they have inevitably uh, applied 
apply to the new technologies to foster the development of ICT sector and also helped the traditional industry to increase their competitive power, number one. Uh, number two, there are, you know, the enterprises and the research institutes are the key, you know, are the key drivers, are the, are the key drivers for the uh, application and the introducement of new technologies, particularly in the field of the AI, in the field of IoT. Uh, as we just, uh, the delegates from uh, Egypt, uh, from uh, Portugal, the delegates have just shown us in the session six why so many, uh, so many uh, corporations are active to change their business model, to introduce the new uh, technologies, because they are ready to, uh, they have to meet the uh, emerging demand of the, uh, of the new uh, terminals and new applications such as e-business, uh, such as digital content services, such as, uh, uh, such as uh, e-health, uh, e-business, uh, e-commerce, and mobile payment. In my country, you know, as it, you may hear about the uh, Chinese market, uh, we can consider China as the world least, uh, world uh, leading country uh, in the field of mobile payment. Why? Because there are three important factors, which are giving, uh, which are giving the uh, you know the growth, uh, which are giving the growth power of the, of, of the mobile payment. So uh, nowadays, uh, every uh, Chinese citizens can can do their businesses uh, with the uh, with the using of the uh, new payment technologies. Ten years ago, uh, according to the uh, research report, uh, research uh, report by uh, McKinsey uh, McKinsey Company, uh, ten years ago uh, the online amount, the online payment amount uh, in USA is, uh, 20, is 10 times, is 10 times as much of the Chinese market. But 10 years later, the number has been, you know, has been worked work back. You know, uh, the Chinese uh, latizens has, uh, you know, used the, the e mobile payment for, uh, in, Every you know customer uh, in every six months ten says, uh, no matter it's online shopping or no matter it's uh, uh, it's time to pay back their uh, credit credit bill. So everywhere you can you can use mobile payment. Number three, uh, this this three important uh, number three important findings we can uh, based uh, we can draw from the discussion in plenary session six that. The policymakers and the regulators have to develop a new system of tools and ways to reflect what's the market reality of the ICT sector and the traditional economy. Because so many fields are be, uh, have, been, have been changed since the introduction of uh, the new emerging technologies such as AI, such as IoT. So uh, the last, maybe the most important for, for our topic, for WTIS, the topic of WTIS uh, 17, uh, we should develop, we should help the government bodies and the regulators to establish uh, new effective tools, how to collect, effectively collect data from uh, different sources of, uh, uh, you know, uh, different sources of, uh, of, of data such, uh, based on new tools. For example, we can base it, we can base it, we can get data from sensors. We can collect data uh, through online, online investigations. We can uh, collect data uh, from the social media, uh, social media networks. So, so many, you can find so many data but how it can be uh, reflected uh, in the process of the public policies and the regulations. 
I can give you some uh, one sample uh, policy uh, practice, uh, which is designed for the which is designed to uh, for regulating sharing bikes in China, sharing bike. So, based on the case of sharing bikes, we can draw a conclusion that if the technology or the big data itself can solve some problems of the new services, then the regulator and the policymakers should not or ought not to, to, you know, to give the severe punk, uh, uh, you know, regulations because the technology itself can solve most of the problems. So we call it inclusive, we call it inclusive regulation tool, inclusive regulation. So we can develop, we can develop a, a set of new regulation tools. We can, uh, we can call it, we can call it inclusive regulation with a third party participation, third party participation. Uh, this is also adapted to the field of the network security and the information protection uh, in the uh, in the new area of inf uh, of the in new area of the information uh, society. So that's my observation. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me move on to Professor Johannes Bohr. Uh, I understand that you have extensive research experience on the economics of ICT industries. And in your session, you raised quite a number of issues that include the direct impact on human life by emerging technologies, big data, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, cloud computing. Now, can you discuss the balance uh, to be struck uh, between the benefits uh, that society is going to draw out of these technologies and the individual's right to be, le uh, to be left alone, privacy issues, and ethical issues associated with these technologies? And what do you think are the challenges associated with measuring uh, these technologies? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, will, I will try to keep brief, but I would like to actually highlight uh, two or three things from, from the session that I also chaired, because it is really important to emphasize uh, these points. I was impressed by the, by the level of detail and expertise that was presented in the report. And I was impressed by the fact that every country actually improved compared to the past year. And I think that's the one message that really needs to be taken away and needs to be emphasized. And I do, I'm old enough to remember a time when, when the situation was very, very grim. And, uh, and I think it's, it's important to really highlight and understand and appreciate the great advances that were being made. Now, the technology cycle is actually uh, shortening in the following sense, that it, it has historically been the case that advanced technologies were um, d developed by the higher income countries. Uh, in, 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 in the current ICT era, the big synergy that exists there is very difficult to replicate in, in, in lower in, uh, income countries and middle income countries is the synergy between knowledge in computing and knowledge in telecommunications. And, uh, Companies such as Google, Apple, and so forth, they, they did well because they had expertise uh, in, in, in computing and could really scale it effectively onto telecommunications networks. But the technologies that come from these developments will be available very quickly and they will not need the same type of uh, computing expertise to be utilized. And that's a great hope in my view, so that we can anticipate that um, services, applications that are related to the Internet of Things, to big data and so forth, will become more rapidly available worldwide and will enable many of the benefits there also. So to come sp back specifically to your question, that is a, that is a very difficult question, I, I have to say, to answer, right? And, and, and um, um, this is several levels. One of the most complicated one, in my view, is the fact that many of the digital economy businesses derive a revenue stream from knowing lots about the individuals that use the services, right? And that's one, one could even say if there's any Achilles heel in the digital economy, that might be the one 
that we, we actually are forced to, uh, to collect individual data uh, to make, create sustainable businesses. And um, so, so regulations and, and policies need to be in place to protect individual privacy in that space. And um, I think we can go further than this than we currently have. At the same time, it's possible and it's, it's, it's necessary to protect individuals' ability to not participate in that sense. Uh, although many of the services that, that currently are available do not necessarily require uh, divulgence of lots of, of private data. So I think my, my point that I made initially was, was we need to sort of more clearly practice principles of human-centered design. And, and start from the individual user, from the organizational user, and then design information systems that, that uh, meet needs uh, that we have while, while respecting uh, legitimate concerns about, about privacy. And I think we, that will be lead in many cases to different types of technologies. And I think that's a great hope for me, also for lower and middle income countries, because we can design technologies appropriate to these contexts and to these spaces that can have great benefits. Th thank you very much for those insights. Uh, Dr. Hamdi, uh, you, you have a history of, and a record of uh, publishing on network technologies. And you are working as head of innovation for Aero Gazala. We, you talked about smart cities, and uh, there was a question from uh, Mozambique. Can you demystify uh, how we could be talking about the high end smart cities, uh, particularly in those countries where the digital divide <coughs> is still a huge challenge, and there is also a data divide, maybe? And maybe you could refer to the case of Tunisia um, and, and tell us how you have probably overcome this challenge. And secondly, uh, what metrics and KPIs uh, do you think are relevant in measuring uh, smart cities? Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I will begin by, uh, by giving rapid wrap up of uh, session seven in which I was the moderator. So, Maybe the first point to underline is that uh, uh, smart cities rely on three building blocks, which are strategy, ecosystem, and technology. And technology maybe comes at the bottom in terms of priority or in terms of criticality, let's say, among these building uh, blocks, because it is the least crucial aspect to cope with the most complicated aspect, and this joins your first question, is to, to devise or to design the appropriate ecosystem for the country or for the city or for the village. And this is not easy to do because you have to identify the complexity and the points that render the interaction between the citizen and the various actors of the ecosystem complicated. And this is the first step towards the success of the smart city project. So this is the first step of the project. And uh, it's also important to underline that there are various measurements or various indicators that can be used to assess the development of smart cities. Maybe they can be seen in terms of two dimensions. The first one is to assess the process itself. This is in terms of percentage in to how extent are we advanced or what is the progress rate in terms, for example, of number of uh, citizens covered by such service. The second dimension is, specifics, is specific to the, uh, to the particular problem solved by the smart city, for example, grid uh, or, for example, health environment. And this has to be identified in the first uh, step. The third point is that the indicators that can be used to evaluate the smart city project are also multifaceted. So we have multiple angles we can look at the smart city from. For example, the societal impact is very important. And 
specific indicators should be used to analyze this angle. We also have the economic aspect that can be measured using some non-traditional uh, metrics. And the third one, which is very important, is that the smart city constitutes an open environment in which innovation can be absorbed uh, and can be uh, valued in terms of uh, the startups research and in order to add uh, new services based on the local ecosystem. And this closes the life cycle of the smart uh, city. And maybe this is the more, the, the, maybe the most important uh, point to underline, for example, for Mozambique or other development or other developing countries in which the ecosystem is not ready enough to, uh, to, uh, to tackle the issue. So to be back to the Tunisian, exam to the Tunisian context, uh, I would say that uh, there are multiple initiatives in Tunisia in order to uh, establish or develop smart cities. Uh, uh, it, it, it will take a lot of time to, to, uh, to, to address all of them, but I would like to point out two very important points. The first one is that in Tunisia, these projects or these initiatives are led by different stakeholders. We have, for example, the city of Benzart, which, in which the project is led by the, uh, by an NGO. Uh, we have other cities in which the leadership is from the government or comes from the government. In other cities, it comes from university or academic institutions. This diversity creates a rich environment in which we will be able to analyze and to assess the uh, efficiency of the leadership with regard to the efficiency of the project of the smart city. The second point is that throughout the development of these initiatives, we are analyzing the difficulties and the complication of our regulatory and, uh, and administrative ecosystem. And this is very important since there are some points that were not investigated before as for other developing countries. And we are, uh, we, we are coming up and we are coping with these problems in the frame of the development of some smart cities projects. So these two points are very important, and these, in, these are, in my opinion, the most important uh, things that can be, or that can be the, the, the result of the Tunisian experience in terms of the development of smart uh, city. Uh, so the last point is about how to measure these smart cities, and the importance is that when you think about a smart city, it is a life cycle, as I said before, and you have to put different <coughs> indicators for each of the phases of this life cycle. And you will have different priorities as far as you are advanced in the project. And I come back to say that there are three uh, main categories of indicators that can be thought of to assess or evaluate the smart cities, which are the societal indicators, the economic indicators, and the innovation indicators. And uh, uh, so, uh, these, I mean that you find in uh, the traditional indicators three uh, very few uh, advances in these directions. And also there is an important point because the contribution of ICT in the development of smart city, when you speak about the internet of things and all of these building blocks, the two most important niches that you can address is the collection phase from the statistical perspective and the analysis phase because ICT or technology will give you the ability to collect more data with a better accuracy and a better reliability. And the problem at the end is how should, I, should we convert this data and this high volume of data into trends, into predictions, into analysis into um, crossover between some uh, different demographic and non-demographic events. So the, these will be the challenges uh, in the near future about how to measure the development of a smart city uh, project. Well, thank you. Th thank you very much to all the panelists for being brief. Uh, we could open the floor for a few interventions or questions, if you could kindly just Give your name and the organization where you come from. Yes, please. Uh, Bangladesh. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving the opportunity to question, to make a question. Yes. 
My question is not directly related to the issues that we have discussed, but it is slightly tangentially related to the topic, uh, to the topics that we have discussed here. One of the presenters slightly mentioned about this issue. The issue I'm talking about is the OTT. As you know, that this has made the life of consumers very enjoyable, but at the same time, it has made the life of the regulator very difficult. It has created a dent in the national exchequer in the sense that there has been a huge, tremendous loss in the revenue earnings of the, uh, from, from the telco sector. The reason I raise this issue that this is a forum where the data is being analyzed analytically, and probably this is the right forum, in the, not now, in the future, they can give us some indication how much we are being affected by the OTT so that we can respond to the public, to the government as a regulator, that the loss of revenue is so much and due to this. And uh, I believe that uh, also, I don't know, we don't know whether this OTT can direct or directly or indirectly or implicitly affecting any of the indicators. I don't know, you, uh, the uh, learned uh, forums can tell us. Uh, but one country cannot do anything against it. I was talking with my friend Ibrahim, uh, the local ITU uh, head here, he was telling me that some of the Arab states have taken a bold step in this area. But I believe that we sh uh, one country cannot do it. It should be done in a community basis, or the whole ITU should give us some direction in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Before I uh, invite the panelists to respond, I would like to invite one more or two more questions. But just to say that this is a very important issue and uh, the ITU Council established a working group uh, of council to look at the issue of uh, OTT. So it is right on the agenda of ITU and it's important. Thank you for raising that. Uh, are there any other? Yes, please, right in the corner. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a few uh, remarks to make in, in terms of, uh, from the point of view of the official, as being an official statistician. Uh, you know, there are, uh, in official statistics, whatever sources we use, that has to pass some tests of the fundamental principles of official statistics. <coughs> so it's good that we're using newer technologies, and a lot of data is being generated in various sectors, which can be augmented with the data which is produced by the government. But once the government puts out a certain set of information in the public domain, it has to be, I mean, government has to put its weight behind it that this is authentic and this is reliable. So, I mean, whether we are thinking in those terms uh, of how to, you know, uh, make use of this data and at the same time be uh, the government be doubly sure that this passes through the fundamental principles. And then carrying forward, I, I also wanted to ask whether there is uh, some sort of discussions happening in terms of the classification of the ICT services and also putting out a sort of metadata document on the ICTs. Uh, these are the three points I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Uh, is that India or? Okay, good. Anybody else, the last question? Okay, I don't, yes, please. Bukina Faso. Oui, merci bien. En fait, il euh, y a un commentaire sur le, les présentations qui ont été faites, euh, particulièrement sur les présentations d'hier. Voilà. Moi, c'est David, je viens du Burkina Faso. Voilà. Donc, je travaille chez le régulateur au Burkina Faso. Il est ressorti des discussions d'hier que certains pays ont des réserves sur certains indicateurs utilisés pour aboutir au classement des pays selon l'IDI. Euh, par contre, il y a euh, 
de convictions communes qui nous réunissent et parmi lesquelles eh, on est tous d'accord qu'il y a des bénéfices à tirer, à travailler à la diffusion des TIC dans tous les domaines de l'économie nationale. On parle de la, numéri la, numé la numérisation de l'économie. Donc, ce qui veut dire qu'en d'autres termes, il y a dépendance de l'économie nationale au numérique, et cette dépendance varie d'un pays à un autre. On peut donc formaliser un indicateur qui évalue ou qui estime le niveau de dépendance d'une économie nationale au TIC. Par exemple, quelle serait par exemple, la variation du PIB national d'un pays donné si le réseau de communication électronique s'arrêtait, par exemple, une journée ou, bon, ou un temps donné, et qui pourrait être défini de façon... Et donc, apprécier, par exemple, quelle peut être l'évolution du PIB. Et, et donc, essayer de, de compléter ou de faciliter la compréhension et, du classement des pays selon l'IDI. Et donc, euh, je pense que peut-être euh, un indicateur qui permettrait de... Euh, qui, qui mettrait tout le monde d'accord serait de voir, de euh, trouver un indicateur qui fait ressortir de façon claire et nette quel est, par exemple, le niveau de dépendance d'un pays donné par rapport au TIC. Et qui pourrait être traduit, ou formalisé ou structuré de façon beaucoup plus précise. Voilà. Parce que les discussions d'hier ont, hier ont permis euh, de voir qu'il y avait des divergences de points de vue, bon, d'autant en, en, en exerce soit la taille de la population, la taille géographique du pays, mais je pense qu'on peut peut-être mettre beaucoup plus en avance un indicateur qui, euh, qui recueille en tout cas, euh, cas euh, l'unanimité ou euh, l'accord de, de tous les participants. Et bon, moi, ce que je vois, c'est qu'au moins tout le monde est d'accord qu'il y a un niveau de dépendance qui varie d'un pays à un autre et de l'économie nationale par rapport au numérique. Et ce niveau de dépendance varie en fonction du niveau de développement des TIC. Et donc, on peut structurer un indicateur qui traduit justement, euh, ces, euh, ces éléments. Voilà, merci. Thank you very much for those questions. Now I would like to invite uh, the panelists uh, to limit your interventions to one minute, if you could, because we, we have extended the patience of the interpreters. So we needed to, to round up. Uh, yes, Dr. Jin. Okay, uh, let's say a few words about the uh, question from the uh, Bangladesh. It is about the topic of, of the OTT services. Based on Chinese market practice, I can tell you that don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, because most of the uh, teleco, telecos are now uh, entering a new phase of uh, operation. New phase of operation is called the, you know, uh, the data-centric uh, growth period. Uh, in Chinese market, uh, several years ago, uh, most telecom operators are worried about the, the loss of the revenue and the, uh, the uh, quantity of the traditional services. But nowadays, after several years of uh, 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 practice, they are now uh, establishing a new uh, framework. We call it ecosystem ecosystem. Uh, it's a very open, it's a very open ecosystem because the internet, internet based operators, the OTT operator uh, uh, service providers can be a partner, can be a partner of the traditional telecos. For example, in Chinese market, some uh, operators has issued a series of uh, uh, lim uh, new kinds of SIM cards which this same card can help, can help the, uh, the end users uh, to consume more, uh, data, uh, more data services instead of, uh, instead of a traditional SIM card. This is uh, number one. Number two, they have uh, uh, established 
they have established a very, you know, a very uh, smart, a very um, uh, adaptive uh, tariff packages. So I don't think the regulator uh, should be in a hurry to decide which is the uh, which side is the, the is the, you know confirmative one or which side is negative one. We we see these. Uh, new ecosystem will be established with the time of the new technology innovation. Uh, that's my observation. Thank you. <clears throat> India, I guess, from the National Security Office. I just a very short message. Of course, that NSOs are very much worried with the fundamental principles for official statistics, but. Uh, you, UN uh, division, uh, statistical division is calling member states to embrace new data sources. And of course that when we mention that it is important to have complementary data source to produce official statistics, we have to keep in mind all the methodological issues that we, hi we have related to this, especially in terms of coverage, or in terms of rep representativeness of the data, but the challenge is in terms of finding ways to have uh, this data source as a, a potential source to produce reliable and quality data without uh, forgetting the fundamental principles of uh, statistics productions. And related to Burkina Faso, uh, questions in terms of bringing new dimensions to uh, measure the impact of ICTs in GDP or IDI or et cetera, I would like to again invite our member states to act actively participate in the both forums because that's where we can bring our views and where we can make contributions on what to measure and how to measure. I think that uh, ITU is an instrumental uh, to this, but ITU is not defining what to measure and how to measure or definitions and concepts. It's up to member states to bring their contributions. So uh, again, I would like to invite all of you uh, to be part of these groups. And if um, you allow me, Cosmo, a, a final word, I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation to ITU to the director of BDT and to you, Cosmos, and also to the ICT Data and Statistics Division team for the support and trust uh, during this period that I chaired the EG8. And I also would like to say that the work that we have been conducting, both work group, would not be possible without the intervention of member states. And uh, not only ministers, but regulator, NSOs, the private sector, so it is very important that you keep your active contribution in both group. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yes, so uh, thank you. I would like to add a very short point about the question raised by uh, by India. Uh, it's fr that from the uh, technical perspective, these fundamental principles are uh, one of their objective is to control the error that can originate at the collection phase of the data. And uh, one of the solutions that can be provided by ICT is to find new ways to control this error. This is because we will not face the same kinds of errors and the control process has been devised in the past uh, by taking into account some hypothesis regarding the morphology of the sample regarding the origin of the data and regarding many other aspects that are now uh, foreseeing a strong and rapid uh, change. That's why one of the most important challenges is to cope with this collection phase and to adjust the uh, control, uh, the error control, so as to keep the same level of fundamental principles in terms of statistics. Thank you. So thank you very much for, for those questions. They are all big questions, and, but I, I would like to comment on each one very, very briefly. The first one was, was OTT players. I think I'm less <laughs> optimistic than, than, uh, <laughs> than my colleague from, from China in that sense that there will be considerable challenges in doing the transition period at least. 
And in part, those challenges can be resolved if regulators adopt a new framework for, for telecommunication operators. Telecommunication operators currently face the challenge that they are in a part of the ecosystem where they have high costs, but the margins tend to be low. Right? And so, so partnering with uh, players who are higher up in the stack, uh, offering services and applications, is a, is a good policy. But frequently, national regulatory provisions limit the ability to do so effectively. Uh, and, and so the operators find themselves in the complicated position that the only party from which they could charge revenues are the users and the subscribers, which may be limited in many ways. So I, I think regulation can help to develop these ecosystems in ways so they can work um, well economically. Also, you know, many of the OTT players are very agile and they come from different backgrounds that, that might be difficult to replicate uh, by, by most operators. Regarding the, the question from India quickly, I think one of the big questions that we didn't address here, but that will face everybody in, in involved in those issues is which types of statistics should be collected publicly by government agencies and made available publicly, and they probably would be the most reliable, highest quality types of indicators uh, that we want to know and that are important for everybody in involved. But there's also a complementary role for other types of sources and they may not be as reliable, they may be more, more agile, more de developed more quickly. And in that case, I think we need to really uh, train ourselves to, to better interpret what, what indicators mean and what we can do with them, right? Maybe triangulate information rather than just relying on one single data source. And I think that that will raise lots of challenges both from the statistics side but also from an educational side. Lastly, that dependence indicator. I think, you know, I agree with uh, Alexandra here that, that the members need to identify those, but I think it, it's an important question that you raise. And uh, um, there's research in some areas, for example, we have studied how dependent other infrastructure industries are on ICT services. And, and the results can be devastating, right? There's, there's tremendous dependence uh, on those sectors, and I think it would be good to have a similar understanding for the economy as a whole. Yeah, can we just give a round of applause to our distinguished panelists, please? Yeah. So before I hand over the, the floor to, to the chairman, uh, I'm persuaded to make a summary, but a summary on a summary does not make any sense. So <laughs> I'm just going to make three points, uh, if you allow me. Uh, first of all, let me go to the IDI and just revisit the issue of the importance of the IDI. The importance of the IDI is not to compare a country against another country. And I wanted to underline this fact. I give you an example. I had a discussion with the delegation of China, and they mentioned that they were considering to introduce an IDI uh, based on their provinces. So that's a typical application. That's what it is meant to be. So it is a tool for self-assessment. And this is why we say all the countries were winners in this year's Measuring Information Society. That's point number one. Point number two. Preparedness is important and is critical. We know that we have migrated from 11 indicators to 14 indicators. But I hope that at national level we are all putting in place mechanisms to coordinate and to make sure that we collect data, quality data, and report it in a timely manner. We have had instances where countries raise an issue after four months uh, that they, what they submitted was not adequate and they wanted to submit a supplementary uh, questionnaire or uh, submission to ITU. We cannot do that because we can't move goalposts. So let's try to collect quality data, involve everybody who is supposed to take part in it, and submit on time. And as you know, ITU always validates the data that you submit. So we kindly appeal to you to respect the deadlines and also to make sure that the data is complete. And that way, we will be able to report uh, the true situation on the ground. The third and last, I think through the work that we are doing on measurement, 
we have an opportunity. And with the emergence of new technologies that have the potential to disrupt social and economic uh, factors, it is important for us to try to avoid an emerging digital divide and also to avoid a data divide because data has become the new oil or new gold and the decisions are based on data and in the future the role of data is going to be very important. And it is not just the big data but it is our ability to extract smart data and we know statistically speaking that currently we have about 14-15% out of all the huge data which is usable or smart data and it is estimated that by 2020 we will only have 32% of that data. We have to make sure that we are ready and finally the other divide we have to avoid is the knowledge data and that is important if we are going to have an information society which is all inclusive. And with these words, I would like to thank you and hand over to, to the chairman. Thank you, doctor, for this uh, conclusion. It's uh, a very uh, heavy conclusion. So we have any one of us, his responsibility on this uh, ADN. It's not the responsibility of the ITU. It's not the responsibility of the tools. It's the responsibility of us. We have to be in time. We have to have quality in our data. And we have to uh, uh, use it to assist our uh, uh, improvement or our progress. So if we, three for three, if we, there is three things to, to take from this uh, meeting. First thing is the infrastructure that's needed. Second thing is the framework policy that's needed. And third thing, and it's very important, is the quality of data that we are collecting and innovation to collect data. We have a, a innovation uh, uh, technology, uh, so we have to, be, to innovate to collect this data. Thank you very much for uh, to this uh, uh, availability because I, I see that a lot of people are still here and st still participating. That's very, very important for the next uh, uh, round of this, uh, of this uh, uh, work. And uh, we will have a meeting or the last meeting at uh, 3 o'clock, huh? at uh, 3 p.m. So I uh, hope we can uh, see you in uh, that time and have a good lunch. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.